All right. Hello, people. Hello, everybody. Uh, the broad topic for today's TEDx RBC session is creating conversation. And in my speech today, I thought I'd take it very literally. But before I begin, I want you all to take a moment to imagine. Imagine being trapped, trapped inside your own body, and being trapped inside your own skin, and not being able to move, and not being able to speak. Just imagine that for a second. And I'd assume many of you would be thinking of something like this. Or perhaps something like this. But today, I want to talk about a different kind of trap. Today, I want to talk about this, ALS. And I'm sure a lot of you might have heard of it from the famous internet challenge that was called the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. Uh, it was a really famous challenge in the early 2010s, and basically what you did was you took a bucket of ice cold water and you poured it upon yourself. But has anyone ever wondered what the point of this challenge was? So, the point of this challenge was to raise awareness. To raise awareness by, when you, when you take this bucket of ice cold water and you pour it upon yourself, for a very brief moment of time you feel what people with ALS feel. You feel trapped, you cannot move. And for a very brief moment of time, you feel paralyzed. So let's talk a little bit about ALS. So it falls under this broad category of diseases that are called the motor neuron diseases. And what these diseases do is they basically affect the system of your brain and your nerves. So your nerves get weaker and weaker and there comes a point in time when your brain can no longer control your body parts. What this means is that you lose control of your body. You can no longer speak. You can no longer move. Just imagine that. I mean, it's awful that you're living, but you cannot do anything. You're, you're thinking, but you cannot speak. You're feeling, but you cannot express. You're living, breathing, and alive, but at the same time, you're, you're not. And the worst thing about these diseases is that there is no cure for them. So, if somebody gets this disease, they take it to the grave with them. And statistically speaking, um, uh, one in 50 people have risk of having such a disease. And a popular example would be uh, Stephen Hawking. I'm sure a lot of you know him. Um, he was a remarkable physicist and scientist who suffered from this disease. And he got it in his early 20s and he started noticing the symptoms and his ability to do daily tasks ceased to exist. He could no longer walk, he could no longer talk, he couldn't do anything. But he was lucky in a lot of ways. He was lucky in the way that he had the backing of a number of different companies like Intel and Microsoft and, and they had like thousands and thousands of employees and millions of dollars of research funds and they came together to create for him a communication system that was called the Hawking's Chair. So it was software and hardware and it came together to give him a voice so that he could communicate like us. But a lot of common people like us, when, we, when, when people common like us, they have this sort of disease. You know, they don't have millions of dollars of research funds. They don't have Intel and Microsoft who would come together and sponsor a communication system for them. So what happens to people like us when we have ALS? Simply put, not a lot of good things. So is there something that we can do about it? Is there something me and you can do about it? Is there something science can do about it? And the answer is yes. But before I start talking about it, I want to share with you guys a little bit of a story that would really highlight my closeness and my interest in this topic. So sometime in 2019, uh, a family member, someone very close and near and dear to me, was on risk for such a disease. And when I got to know about it, I was horrified. I was devastated to know the suffering these people go through. And it was terrible. I mean, I could not 
Imagine a family member wishing that they would rather die than continue living on like that. And I knew that Intel and Microsoft would not sponsor us. We don't have thousands of employees working for us. We don't have millions of dollars of research funds to put into like a communication project for ourselves. So I thought something had to be done. And if it has not been done before, it had to be done now. So then I started thinking and I started researching on this and I looked at this problem from the perspective of the patients themselves. So I thought, uh, people with ALS cannot talk. They cannot move. So is there something that they can do? And I got it. They can think. They can think just like the rest of us. They can think like normal people. But here's the problem. They can think like us. I mean, of course, their system of nerves is affected, so what they think cannot be transported to their different parts of the bodies. But they can still think. So if some way we could pick up what they're thinking, we could make it work. But here's the deal. Mind reading is not possible, right? I mean, there is no way we can know what someone is thinking, right? Wrong. Turns out, it is possible. Not uh, like they showed in Hollywood and cinemas, but it's kind of possible. So uh, it's possible through uh, electroencephalography. It's a long, complicated word. What does it mean? Well, uh, when we think, our brain produces these kind of waves. And these waves have different magnitudes, different wavelengths, uh, different amplitudes, and different frequencies based on what we're thinking. So let's say a, a happy thought, a relaxing thought, could have a brainwave like this, and a stressing thought could have a brainwave like that. So I thought I'd work with this. But how do you catch these waves? Well, you build a brain-computer interface. Uh, it sounds very complicated, but it's not. It's actually, you just put electrodes on different parts of your scalp, and through a wire, you pass on these signals into a circuit that cleans the signal reduces any noise and then just goes to, into a computer and you can read it. It's actually simple. So, I thought I'd work with two waves and I, I'm pretty sure people who have done computer science before can see what I'm going through with this. I take two waves and I clean them and I signal them. And I already have myself a binary communication system. I can use these two waves as ones or zeros or yeses or noes or ons and offs or agreement or disagreement. So how does this work? Well, you ask them a question. You tell them if they want to answer it yes, they can stress out. If they want to answer it no, they can relax. But that was too boring. I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to talk to my family member and have them just answer in yes and no. I wanted to have proper conversations with them. I just wanted to have normal, actual conversations with them and have them create sentences. So then, I put in 10th grade Python coding knowledge and I created this software. Uh, it's a simple software. Uh, it has different slots for words. And each of these words can be picked from a scrollable list. And you can stress and relax to move up and down in these lists. But there was another problem. There are millions and millions of words in the English dictionary. And if you scroll through all those words, it would take you ages to create even the simplest sentence and I was confused. So then came the hardest part of my journey. Um, this took me months and months to create. So um, I was texting one of my friends and I saw this. So I'm pretty sure you guys have seen it as well. Um, when you start typing a sentence or you're typing a document, you get accurate word suggestions as you're going on. And a lot of these times, these words are very relevant and very accurate. I mean, you start typing a sentence, you already have a suggestion coming on top of your keyboard. So this is basically artificial intelligence. What it does is it looks at a bunch of factors, and it just suggests to you a relevant and accurate word. So it's like, yeah, I could work with this. So the next few months, I spent making my own artificial intelligence model, and it looked at a number of factors, and then it kind of suggested a word that was relevant and accurate. So then I came, I had the system of software and hardware that I called the MindTalk project. And I took it to a number of science fairs and stuff, but the kind of coronavirus happened and whatever. 
But luckily for me, the family member I made this for, they were very lucky and they didn't go through the worst of the disease. But I kept working on it, kept polishing it because I knew that there would be someone who might need such a technology for themselves. There would be someone like me who would not have uh, millions of dollars or thousands of employees working for them. And I did. But that's not the point I'm trying to make. This is not a product launch. I'm not trying to get you to buy my product. No, that's not what I'm doing. I'll probably not even launch this product because as I read EG News every day, I'm pretty sure there would be some uh, big company, big tech company who's going to beat me to this idea and probably already has. The point that I'm trying to make is that the world around us is evolving and progressing so fast. And uh, especially when it comes to technology and things that seem so impossible to do like mind reading or something like that are becoming easier to do every single day. And, you know, the point that I'm really trying to make is that uh, if you told someone from 50 or 100 years ago about things that we do so casually and normally today, like use internet or use your smartphone, they'd call you a fool. And so will the people of today when you talk to them about ideas that would be normalized 50 or 100 years from now. What I'm trying to say is that you don't need to be Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg or Steve Jobs or Elon Musk to come up with ideas that would change the world or to come up with solutions to the world's greatest problems. They're humans just like us. And if you really feel strongly about a problem and have, you have the determination and motivation to stick to your idea, I'm pretty sure there's no problem in the world that is too big to be solved. And even if it has not been solved by the greatest minds to exist, it is not impossible for you to solve it. You just need a good idea, a motivation, and determination to stick to your idea. And if you have them, incredible.